Welcome everyone. I'm Glory Simmons, director of the Thatcher Gallery at the University of San Francisco. Before we hand this event over to Antoine and the artists, I would like to pause for a land recognition. The University of San Francisco sits on the homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone people. We recognize this rich cultural heritage that has survived colonization and genocide and value Ohlone artists past, present, and future. As with all exhibitions and public programs, there are many individuals and groups to thank for making a matter of liberation possible, including USF's web and CIT teams, our student employees, the, the very essential gallery staff who are stage directing this event tonight, Prison Renaissance, our collaborator, and the Jesuit Foundation. I would also like to acknowledge Amy Dowling and Shana Hammerman for helping to lay the groundwork at the beginning of this collaboration. Most importantly, I want to express our sincere gratitude to the artists and our amazing collaborators. Thank you, Antoine, Emile, Eddie, Sarah, Jason, and Orlando, who can't be here this afternoon, for sharing your talent and artwork, your insights and experiences with the USF community, especially at this time when there are so many challenges to overcome personally and in our communities. We are honored to provide a forum for your artistry and to celebrate you tonight. A huge warm thank you goes to Emile de Weaver, co-founder of Prison Renaissance for leading us on this journey begin, that began two years ago and for introducing us to Antoine as our curator. Antoine Banks Williams is a co-creator and sound designer for the award-winning podcast Ear Hustle, as well as a musician, producer, filmmaker, visual artist, and now curator. He is a Renaissance man. We couldn't imagine being in better hands at this particular moment. Thank you, Antoine, for being a courageous, optimistic, unflappable, ever inventive curator as we navigate these unpredictable times. I want to invite the audience um, to three of our upcoming programs, all on Thursdays at five o'clock like this one today. On September 24th, USF's Museum Studies program will present Sean Kelly speaking about prison museums as sites of conscience. On October 15th, the Jesuit Foundation and Thatcher Gallery will host A Matter of Liberation, a lecture by James King and moderated by Emile de Weaver, who you'll meet tonight. On October 29th, the Jesuit Foundation and Thatcher Gallery are excited to bring um, to campus, um, to our virtual campus, Ear Hustle, in conversation with the co-curators, Erlon Woods, Nigel Poor, and Antoine Banks-Williams. If you haven't already, don't forget to visit the online exhibition at the gallery's website. This event will also be recorded and shared on that website later. Now for a little logistics, um, we will soon meet the artists and Antoine. Then each artist will introduce their work and then come together for conversation and Q&A. We probably won't get to all of the Q&A, so um, toward the end, we will also open up the chat so that you can send congratulations or sign in and ask more questions that um, we'll try to get to in the near future. So now it's my chance to turn it over to Antoine to introduce the artists. Oh, Glory, thank you, thank you. I, um, I'm beyond humbled to be in this position. So first and foremost, I would love to just send my, my, my deepest appreciation to you, to Nell, to all of the artists, Emil, Sarah, Eddie, Jason, you guys have been my rock throughout this entire thing. Um, I will not go into deep introductions about you guys because you guys have the full capabilities to do that for yourselves. And I think 
in this given in this day and age and this time that we live in, I think people should speak for themselves, right? Like we should all speak our truths, and we can only do that if um, we have the opportunity to. And I am just humbled that I have an opportunity to give you guys an opportunity to showcase your talents, your unique perspectives, and all that you offer to the world. So without that, I want to say thank you to everybody who is in attendance. Like, man, this is super big. This is a, for me, it's been nine months working on this and I've only been out 10 months. So I got out and Emil like graciously asked me to, to step in and because of a relationship that we have built during our incarceration in a bond and a network and a team um, that we have done amongst each other, right? Is, it has made it easier for me to step into that. So Emil, for that, I thank you. But with that, I want to get into his piece, White Lives Matter. It will speak for itself. Let's get to it. A white bird said Black Lives Matter assassinates police. Well, readers, you put on badge. You go out there if you don't like overreaction by police under siege by black men. Emmett Till. Emmett Till. Emmett Till. Officer Michael Prelo was acquitted in Cleveland after firing 49 of 137 shots. 49 of 137 shots. 49 at an unarmed couple whose car backfired one out of one time. Brillo hopped on the hood like Carl Tom Cruise in a movie and fired an entire magazine of 15 rounds into the lovebirds at point blank range. Under sea, Brillo fired. protecting and serving while Black Lives Matter assassinates. Have you yet imagined the settlement the family of these dead will get from Cleveland while LeBron James's magnificent form sails through the sound of shutter clicks, leaving his shadow fading on the hardwood? We're talking million dollar bodies. President Obama, Kanye meets Trump, black cop kills white woman. Black bird told me my people are strong and proud after carrying Rome for 400 years, as if my people need self-esteem more than Justice as if black are only those standing tall beneath the bricks and not the millions crawling from prison, not the casualties found on their mother's kitchen floors, needle marked like slaves and dead in their vomit, as if people, any people, don't harden like stone till they fracture while the mocking bird sings. Don't turn to drugs or violence. Turn to Jesus of the flowing locks. Learn that God cursed Ham cause Ham laughed at father's dick. Cause Cain killed Abel cause Eve was a white witch but she whispered with a black mouth. Now with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Emil DeWeeve. Welcome into Berea for Browns Live Training Camp presented by Snapple, Nathan Zagura alongside Josh Cribs and... Well, spoiler alert, this is live and this is Zoom. So if anything happens out of character, hey, it's art. Go with the flow, people. It's going to be all right. We're going to get through this. We all in this together, baby. Yeah, we're going to keep going. 
So we're gonna get a, a, a um, we're gonna get Emil to hop on and to give you guys more insights to his piece. I do. I'm continuing with the live. I could not get that audio to go to my headphones. So I had to just run to another room. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Emil DeWeaver. I'm the co-founder of Prison Renaissance, and um, and I'm also a black artist and activist living in the Bay Area. Um, and as you said, the piece speaks for itself. White lives matter. But I guess some um, some background on like why I wrote the piece. It was just coming from a place of deep frustration around like the double speak. Uh, kind of endemic in white supremacy and like kind of like the baseless narratives that um, that people use and cling to as if they have legitimacy even though like they clearly don't like for like the the, the prime example is the idea that like black lives matters is somehow a threat to uh, a militarized police force in the United States of America um, uh, we, 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 you know, you and I are very familiar with the narratives around like, you know, how laughable the idea that the police are under siege by like uh, people in our community, right? Uh, when we know that like all of our lives, like when we were out there, like when the police come, people run. And they run because they're scared. Uh, so the idea that like this militarized force of uh, trained killers somehow is like under threat by uh, the masses of civilians they oppress is just laughable. And so um, the piece was like speaking to that um, and putting the ugly words on the ugly reality. So I know that there is, there is a lot to like take in with that piece, right? Like there is, there is so much more that is like attached to it that like we don't have enough time in the day to kind of go into. But as you um, stated earlier, you are the co-founder of Prison Renaissance. Like, could you please, please, like just for the viewers, right? Like, can we talk a little bit about that? Like your role, how did it come to be and introduce our next artist? Yeah, so Prison Renaissance, me, Rasan Thomas, Carlos Meza, who's now out right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, we founded this organization in prison because uh, for a few reasons, but like the biggest reason is um, there is a gap in um, what we call prison programming in that like most prison programs uh, rely on prison administrators as the gatekeepers for whether or not they can exist. And what that does is it creates like a deep conflict in it, of interest where like programs aren't actually allowed to like serve the incarcerated people they're trying to serve. So we want to make a program for and by incarcerated people unconnected to the state that could actually uh, like serve the people it's trying to serve. And we wanted it to be led by the people it's serving. Um, and uh, this next piece is kind of like an illustration of that because mostly uh, we uh, it's COVID and, you know, best case scenario, Orlando would have been here himself over the phone. That's like a really tried and true method that Prison Renaissance uses is it uh, connects incarcerated people to audiences I hear over the phone and, you know, through and using like a, a speaker system for, uh, for a two-way conversation. Uh, in this case, COVID means that like people in prison aren't getting the access to phones. And so we couldn't really coordinate with uh, him in the way that we generally do in these programs. Um, but the goal that we try to achieve, and that is like getting the voice of incarcerated people uh, directly to people uh, out here, uh, we can still like present his work and do our best to um, do it justice. And so uh, Orlando sent us the grueling report that he wanted to include in this exhibition. Uh, and I paid him to include me. So you see that I'm I'm, I'm in the comic now and, uh, and, and, you know, what Orlando is doing is like, he has had this mission, like, you know, he grew up and he loved comic books, uh, but what he always saw in comic books was like no faces that ever looked like him. Uh, and so he has his own personal mission of like creating comics with like people of color and about issues of 
uh, that matter to people of color. And in this particular instance, he has taken that gift to uh, what he call, what is uh, what he calls and what uh, in this new form of uh, journalism called like graphic journalism. And he's telling the story of the COVID outbreak in San Quentin, and he's telling the story of um, the political, uh, the lack of political will to do the right thing by like re reducing prison populations by 50% and the excuse being uh, centered around this, uh, this, 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 this narrative uh, fallacy called like violent offenders. Um, and, you know, we reached a point where we kind of understood that criminal was the new N word. Uh, like you can't be uh, overtly racist anymore in the society. So we come up with like new code words to uh, demean people and like justify uh, um, uh, white supremacist treatment of people. Um, and criminal was one way that uh, this society has like figured out to do that people have started to realize that and that's become more popular. And then, so the new word is like violent offender because with that word, we can attach a lot of fear and we can, we can get away with a lot of dehumanization because people aren't thinking about other people's de dehumanization when they're thinking about their fear for themselves. So um, this piece is about Governor Newsom's reliance on that word uh, violent offender in order to avoid like doing the, the thing that's like his responsibility to do, and that is uh, reduce prison population so people aren't dying needlessly of COVID. Thank you, Emil. Um, again, right, like these are these are, are are different forms of art that all come from very op oppressive places, right? Like I have had the I can say this, I've had the privilege to be amongst these men in like the hardest times of my life, right? And to be in a place where not only do, do um, people choose to redefine their narrative and to redefine their identity, but to take hold of that and to use that in a way that changes things for other people, right? Like again, I have done a lot of work, a lot of extensive work, a lot of creative work with Emil and I've also done the same thing with Orlando. And this is just one snippet of what an artist has to offer. This is one snippet of what he has done and has sent beyond, right? And when I think about the connections and when I think about like as far as how far I've come throughout my incarceration and the things that I wanna do in the world now, like that's, that directly extends from the work that Emil did on himself that extends from the creativity of Orlando Smith, right? Like, and it also brings me to our next artist, which, fun fact, for those that don't know, this was my bunkie. My last year, over a year, but just about a year and a half of my incarceration and his, we were bunkies. So I didn't just get a chance to share in a, a living space with this person, but I got to share in an intellectual space and an emotional space. And a lot of the things that like I hold near and dear to my heart, like when it comes to value, when it comes to um, identity, when it comes to integrity, like these are things that these artists has given to me. So I am a reflection of the artists that you are seeing. And this is just, this is just one snippet. This is just one little glimpse into like deeper conversations, more work that we, that we have put in so without any further ado, I would love to introduce you guys to my brother, a person that I consider family, Jason Perry. Thank you, man. I appreciate that, bro. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about this piece, man, uh, my chain response. Because it's a piece, it's a piece that it struck me during the um the killing of uh, Tamar Rice. At that particular time, my son was the same age and he kind of looked like my son. And it just moved me because it's, it's not just one person or one family that's dealing with the abuse that we're going through. 
It's not just one person. That's why he's faceless because it's not about one man. It's not about one woman or one, one child or one family. Right now, I feel like we're being hunted and, 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 and any excuse given for them to pull their service weapon and fire, they taking it, man. And I feel that we're trapped because if I fight back, you're going to kill me. If I don't do nothing, you're going to kill me. So my hands are out to you, and I define the hands in this piece because it was a brilliant man that told me before that hands are the things that change things. They sign bills in the law. They deliver babies. You know, they make music. You feel me? So I wanted the viewer to look at the hands more because when you, when you handcuff these things, you're handcuffing my ability to be a man, to provide for my family, to help this nation be stronger. You're, you're holding me back. You're my own Achilles heel, and I'm an American. So I plead to you. I'm pleading to you. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's why I chose to, 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 to pay so much attention to the hands. And also, I paid attention to the body because we're strong. If we did the stuff to you that you did to us, you break. But we're strong. We're fine. We just wanted to be treat. We just want to be treated equally. We're not asking for anything extra. Even though I know when the Constitution was written, I was just chattel property. But you understand now that you were wrong. Your forefathers were wrong. I'm a human being. I'm a man. I have desires and dreams and fears just like you do. And I wanted the viewer to see this and look and understand that I'm asking the question. Why? That's what that piece means to me, man. Thank you. Um, again, like for those that don't know, Jason Perry is a is a phenomenal artist. And if you haven't done it already, like go online, check out the exhibition, right? Like check out each artist, go to their pages, um, go to their social medias, check their, their uh, interviews out on YouTube because it gives more insight and more um, context to why these pieces were created, right? Like what space we were in. And when we think about matters of liberation, one of the things that I, I am like very, very firm on is that for artists, liberation is an act, right? And the art that we create sometimes is simply the result of our liberation, right? Like it's our process. It's what we do to get through the things that we are like currently dealing with. And when we, and when you are facing such oppressive conditions like mass incarceration, you have to look at the things that are, have been continuing to bind you, have been continuing to keep you captive, if not in your mind, if not emotionally, if not spiritually, it's physically, right? Like we are all, um, we are all imprisoned by something, regardless to if that space is concrete and bars, or if that space is negative thinking, or um, if it's something that we don't have and we're trying to obtain, like that is a prison, right? Like not being able to let go or have the agency to do what it is that you wanna do. And as we go to the next artist, fun fact, 
I have to t- let you guys in on again. As I said, like Jason Perry is somebody that I hold near and dear to my heart, but he's also the person that enlightened me to George Stinney Jr. And for those that don't know who George Stinney Jr. is, like I will talk about it. Like this is the piece that I chose to elaborate on. And before I go any further, if anybody have any comments, questions, like please send them, right? Like we want to, we want to hear from you guys. I want to hear from you guys. I want to know all that you guys are thinking and feeling right now. So please, please uh, um, throw them in that chat. Boop. You know what I'm saying? Question and answer. Bop. Drop that thing. But as we get to this piece, it's called 14 Years. And again, for those that do not know who George Stinney Jr. is. George Stinney Jr. is the youngest person in America to have been convicted and executed. He was 14 years old when he was executed in South Carolina in 1944 for, a, for two murders of two young white girls by the age of seven and 11. And when, when Jason told me this, I'll never forget, we're in San Quentin State Prison. We in five building, uh, what was it, 5H69. I remember the bunk we were sitting <laughs> in. He's reading a magazine. I come in and he say, yo, have you, have you heard of this story? And I sit down and he lays, he lays it all out to me. Again, in 1944, a young man was convicted of murdering two young white girls. That's like out there. But what people don't know is that his father, George Stinney, was actually the person that started the search and rescue team to like gather the children, to find, to, to, so it was a mass search, let's find these kids, right? Like that people are missing, like people uh, um, love these children and they are no longer here, so let's find them. But in doing that, that's one of the things that got his son locked up. And with this painting I chose to do is at the very basis, I put Black Truths Matter. Because again, when we think about narrative, when we think about acts of liberation, when we think about um, acts of defiance, sometimes the truth is an act of defiance. When the norm and when the culture is preparing us to perpetuate, to continue to perpetuate a narrative that dehumanizes and that um, disenfranchises certain people, like that is an act of violence. But that's also something that gets covered up. So when I started the canvas, all I wanted it to say was Black truths matter, but I wanted the truth to be in gold because the golden truth about this story, about this tragedy, is that the only thing that they can do to connect George Stinney Jr to these young women who were savagely beaten and taken away was that they asked him where could they pick flowers earlier that day. That's it. Now, regardless to if we think or if we know, um, regardless to if we believe that the justice system did what it was supposed to do, the reality is two communities were manipulated. One community was stripped away and the truth was taken away and another community was lied to. And that is just as terrifying as anything else. And 70 years after his execution and his trial only lasted two hours. His trial lasted two hours and at 14 years old, he was sentenced to death by a jury of none of his peers. But 70 years after his execution and his conviction was vacated. So I chose again to take his actual mugshot. And I chose that to be the, 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 the focal point. And instead of having something more realistic, I wanted hard outlines. I wanted to look almost cartoonish again to make people realize like, man, this was a child, man. This was a person who was 14 years old and yet and still he was subjected to an execution that was created for the worst of the worst. 
And in our society in 1944 in South Carolina, the truth, the, the, the norm, the truth that this, that this culture, that this community chose to accept was that this 14 year old boy was worse of the worst. And with all of the writings, those are actual facts from the case. And I wanted to make sure that, the, that it wasn't legible, that it wasn't like you can just look at it and read it because this, this, like all of this is public record. Anybody can figure out and anybody can learn like what has happened to George Stinney, George Stinney Jr., excuse me. Anybody can figure that out, but we have to, it has to be on us to do the research. We have to want to know the truth. We have to continue to like push and dig and find and research so we are better equipped with the tools that we need to build a better future. Because if we rely on the stories that we have been told, the narrative is going to be, this was a, a boy, this was a person who was tried, who was convicted of a jury of his peers and sentenced to death for a crime that he did. That's what the narrative is going to tell you. And if we rely on everything that everybody else has told us, like we will all come to the same conclusion. So on top of that, I just chose to write and smear paint and to use um, stars and stripes and all of the thing, all of these little things that have direct connections to the United States in general. But the image itself can't be washed over. The truth can't be forgotten. It has to be something that we have to be able to see, not on the, our initial glance at it, but it has to be something where we're choosing to look deeper. And that was my challenge with this piece was, let's choose to look deeper. Let's choose to go deeper. Let's choose to go and be better. Because if we don't, we will find ourselves in the exact same place, following in the same structures of a system that was built and established on disenfranchising and choosing who their victims are. If I don't challenge this, then ultimately I feel like I'm saying that the system that convicted and executed this 14 year old child was right. So again, um, this really hit home for me. And I hope that this is a story I would encourage you all I would encourage everybody to look into not just this story, but other stories of injustice, other stories of mistreatment, other stories of neglect, to say the least, right? Because that's exactly what our society has done for so long, especially to people who come from communities that don't have the resources or that don't have the privilege to say this isn't right. Sometimes that in itself is a privilege. Our voices have been silenced, our truths have been hidden, and now is, is the climate, now is the time we are at a birthplace of change. And it's like, it is imperative that we all do whatever it is that we can do because this is an act and this is a matter of liberation. This is about changing and freeing people that have been bound and captive for so long in so many different ways. Again, I am not only speaking about literal. I just find it oddly, I find it scary that the people that I have come across that have this kind of insight is also people who have been caged for so long. Emil, 20 something plus years. Jason Perry, 18, he just finished doing 18 years. And he got out 10 days after I did. He went to prison before I did and he got out after I did, right? And it's, and me serving 13 years, right? Like, but this is the kind of injustice that we have endured, that we have survived, that we have um, thrived. We have, we grew in these places. And this, again, we are a reflection of so many people who are still in there. Orlando Smith. There's a lot of artists who are choosing to liberate themselves in other 
manners that that matters just as much as them actually gaining their freedom. So again, I thank you. And now I get and now it is my pleasure again to introduce this next artist who is another phenomenal person that I actually met while I was incarcerated, right? Like this is what prison has done and this is what makes me believe that we are on a divine journey. We are on a universal path that is connecting each and every one of us. So for everybody who is in attendance, you are here for a reason and I honor you and I thank you and I would love to introduce you to the wonderful Sarah J. Cruzan. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I want to lead moving forward in all full transparency and um, acknowledging how trauma can show up for people and how people experience trauma in different manners. So, um, which, you know, I just want to say thank you for sharing this space and having these hard conversations about what's important for us and the things that we've endured and how we process it. For me, <laughs> I've got some issues with men, okay? <laughs> I am not happy with men and I've got some real strong issues with black men because I feel that there's a conscious choice that you make when you make a decision um, to impose something on a person. So. This particular piece, it's untitled intentionally because I want my, my I want to invite people to look at it and view it, whether they're the giver of this trauma or the receiver of the trauma. Um, so those, <laughs> so this particular piece, it took me a minute to conjure up the strength to even present it for myself. I was very afraid of my own body. I'm still learning to be able to sit in my body. My body betrays me and very deep. Oh, it's difficult, but it betrays me deeply. <laughs> my mind will tell me one thing and my body's like, whoa, <laughs> I don't think so. So it, it required a lot of courage for me to do this piece. I put grapeseed oil on the front part of my body as a therapeutic way to kind of neutralize the trauma that had been imposed upon me by other people. And then I wanted to kind of like give it a hug, you know, like as we nurse our children, as we hold people, love folks, we will bring them here close to our heart. So I felt like, well, let me just take this blank piece of canvas with grapeseed oil and impose it and impress it and whatever comes out, I'll move from there. And what I saw was this way that the grapeseed oil kind of captured this pressure that I had applied. And, um, and I just let it go. I just let it go. And the burning, the, the red is anger, of course, but there's also a passion and there's a fury and there's a fire in it. And I wanted to just not limit how the strokes came out. Because when those that had touched me, they weren't thinking about how they were touching me. They were just violently touching me, right? Like, mm. So their passion. And I wanted to kind of like be an open channel for that energy. And that's what was coming out. There was a lot of groping, as you can see, the three marks, the groping of the breast um, closest to my heart. Um, and then I lit the piece on fire, right? So like I'm in my, my apartment and I'm like, I'm gonna light it up, let me see. Like totally bad, right? Like, oh God, I'm violating parole. But like, I felt so, I felt so moved to do it because I have felt like my soul has been on fire for a long period of time and I've had to contain that fire. So, um, you know, I was mindful <laughs> and then I thought, okay, let me go get particular pieces of my transcript. So those are original pieces from my court documents. Um, and I wanted it to tell the story, and it does. So it, if you look closely, you can see what was, you know, transcript and how people of authority and position knew. It was documented. And I felt that that was very important for people to see because I was being accountable for this 
And I wanted everyone to kind of hold space with me. And down here at the lower left hand upside down intentionally because everything that my, 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 my experience presented somehow to me felt upside down and it didn't feel complete. It didn't make sense. And some of the most strongest words, because words hold power and sometimes people become sterile to words. But if you take the time to really look at it, you'll see. So I wanted people to capture that. There was a mishap here. There was a hiccup. Okay, and then I thought we can do better, right? <laughs> you know, can you pay attention to this? Then maybe you'll be willing to come in and pay attention to some real stuff that we got going on. And then I felt like, yeah, all these things that happened to me, yeah, I don't know how many men have physically imposed their trauma on me and I've been the receiver for it, this body, okay? Because my body holds it. And then I wanted to set the piece on, on fire close to my heart. And then I cut out this little butterfly. I can put it in there. Because I felt, I think a lot of us are conditioned for me to believe like we lead with our conviction. Well, I'm, I'm going to lead with my trauma. Okay. And I'm okay with that. This is what has happened, and it's residual, and I don't have to put on a persona, and I don't want to have to mask myself, because I want to be as raw as naked. Is this where I mute myself? Again, in the interview with Sarah and I, we talked about this, but I truly thank you for being where you are for, far, far enough in your journey to where you can be that transparent, that open, because again, like this is not easy work. And, and I'm asking for all of the viewers out there, right? Like start to speak your truth. If you have comments, if you have concerns, if something has resonated with you, like put it in the Q&A, right? Like we will have time and space to further these conversations, but this is where it has to start. This matter of liberation, it has to start now. And it's not gonna look the same for everybody, but we have to start. We have to, it's imperative. It is almost dire that we start to liberate ourselves from the very, things that have been keeping us bound for so many years. And like Sarah was saying, that might be self-imposed or that might be traumas inflicted by other people. We might just be the reciprocants of that, but we don't have to continue to be prisoners of it. So Sarah, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like your work is phenomenal. That is beautiful. That is why art should exist that is why art matters that is why this event is important that is why we as artists are important that is why your voice that is why your perspective this is exactly why this is meant to happen so before we go any further we are coming to the end of the artist just speaking but we will have time and space again for question and answers or we are going to have a conversation just amongst the artists but this next person I want to actually um, introduce is another good friend of mine by the name of Eddie. Yes, Eddie Herrera. We serve time together. And what a, fun facts, fun fact Thursday. When I started my prison sentence, Eddie and I were in the same prison. I knew of him because I always seen him, but we didn't know each other. And it's crazy how our journeys ended at the same place. Um, but Eddie is a photographer and i think that the work that he does is so essential to the work that i'm trying to do because his work is not about himself his work is about highlighting other individuals and as we talked as we uh, heard from 
Emil, as we heard from Jason, myself, and now we just heard a beautiful, I'm at a loss for words for what Sarah just chose to offer. We get again to bring it back. We get an opportunity to bring it back to the people that were originally supposed to be a part of this process. And that is the voices and the lives of incarcerated people. Because of COVID, we had to make all of these changes, but that doesn't mean that we have to stop and that doesn't mean that they cannot be a part of this process. They are a part of our lives, they are a part of our communities, they are a part of our future, our past, our traumas, and our healing. And so, Eddie, my main man, can you do me a solid and talk about <laughs> the photo of your choice? Young brother, bring us home. Oh, let's go, let's go. Um, hello, everybody. First and foremost, like Antoine, Emil, it's, it's you guys, you guys, I've always looked up to you guys. You guys have always been an encouragement to me. So glad to be a part of this. So glad to be a part of this movement. And uh, yeah, man. Cool. Thanks. But um, yeah, I guess I chose this picture not because it was like the best, but like he, this, this individual represents like a large part of the prison population like he's like older gray hairs like and like when this and this guy he used to be my celly but but that's not why i chose this picture like he represents a big group in prison that like didn't go to prison when they were this age they've been in there this long they've been aging in this place and i just want to like let the world know like hey man like people are rotting in this place man and it's not fair it's not cool it's not nice like what kind of what kind of society do we do we operate here man so that's basically why i chose this picture um it's i mean if you want to talk technical it's like well framed and it's like pretty pretty in focus but like this guy represents people man he's one of many that been in prison way too long and he has a name his name is nika and that's what people fail to realize man like when you go to like when i went to prison i was like lost like buried, you're basically buried alive like the world forgets about you so a main part of like my goal in this exhibition was to like not to focus on the traditional mugshot like like antoine did even though they're kind of like parallel, like, no, but this is a portrait of a person who happens to be in a place where he shouldn't be anymore. And, 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 and all the, and all the people in my photos, they're, they're just like me and you, man. There ain't no, there, there's no difference. They're brothers, they're sons, they're fathers. They smile, they laugh, they cry, just like everybody else. And it's, it's just sad, man. It saddens my heart that like, they're just forgotten and like nobody, nobody cares. Nobody cares. It's easy. It's easy to, to lock somebody up and forget about them. So like when I had the opportunity, like, so I, I was the prison um, newspaper photographer. So um, when I, when I wasn't taking pictures for the newspaper, like, I had this idea of like, you know, man, I'm gonna take pictures of people because the world needs to see these, see these faces. Um, we're not numbers, we're people, we got names. So that's always been like at the forefront of like my mission as a photographer, like while incarcerated was to show the world that there's a bunch of people in here, man. And it's just, it's, uh, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that they're still in there, they're still in there and they, and they really shouldn't be, they really should not be in there, man. I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to like be given a second chance, but it's, it's, there's, there's not enough second chances for the rest of the guys in there. And I just want to show the world, man, like, yeah, man, there's, there's real people in there. And you, like when it comes to voting and like 
<clears throat> participating in the political system, like really, really consider that. Really think about like what our society is doing with its own people. So that's kind of my, that was kind of my focus here, just to show y'all that like these people are just like, just like you, just like you, no different, no different, just like you. And um, I hope I hope I um hope I accomplish that. And, um, yeah. But that's pretty it's pretty much it. Thank you, Eddie. Um like you said, man, um they're forgot about, right? And my question to those that are that are in attendance. When have you felt um, forgotten about? And how long has that feeling um, existed, right? Like, is it something that passes over time? Is it during seasons or holidays? Is it, is it something that you've been dealing with, that you've been living with, that you've been having to sit in for decade and decade and decade, like, year in and year out because I'm a, I, I'm a speak for myself, but I feel empowered enough to be able to speak for the artists that are in attendance. Like we dealt with that year in and year out. And for so long, these Jason, Emil, Eddie, right? And this is who I had a chance to connect with. I can only imagine the women that Sarah grew up with, that were her teachers, her mentors, her providers, right? Like you, you go into prison and you don't stop living. It's not a casket. It's not you and it's not over. It's you and everybody else that's in there. And having the courage to, for one, pass the blessing that you have um, obtained to pass that on to other people is something that gets overlooked. And there's so many people that are in there that are still fighting for their liberation. And I'm again, I'm asking for all of those that are in attendance, like, man, tell me, I want to know, I want to hear how you have felt forgotten, how you have felt left out, how you have felt overlooked or mistreated or how, like, tell me your truths because I know minds and we have had an opportunity to speak to ours, but this is a conversation that has to go beyond the artists that are in attendance. This is a conversation that has to extend into your household. This is a conversation that has to take hold of your community. This is a conversation that has to be a part of your day-to-day -day life because if it isn't, you are agreeing to being imprisoned. There are more people that feel the way I feel. There are more people that have experienced the emotions that I have, that Sarah has, that Eddie has, that Jason has, that Emil has. We have family in there. We have family. We have people that we love. We have people that have taught us, that have shown us how to be better versions of ourselves. And I would be remiss. I would be a fool. I would be ungrateful if I didn't take this time to acknowledge the people that are left behind. So what do we do? In matters of liberation, what do we do? Do we confine? Do we conform? Is art going to be our act of defiance? Is our way of saying, no, I'm going to grow? Is that our only opportunity that we have to change the dynamic of the communities that we come from. And so when your community don't look like mine and all we share is this experience, we all share a community. So again, don't hesitate, don't play, get into the questions and answers, send comments, let your voice be heard. Because for so long, it might have been silenced. But today is the day that I am encouraging. I am pushing. 
I am pleading and I am begging that the silence stops, that we start speaking and we start acting out in a way that brings about a greater form of our own existence and those that are around us and the spaces that we share. So now we're gonna open up a dialogue, a conversation amongst the artists about the pieces that we've seen, right? This is one of the things that I've learned on the inside is that encouragement is sometimes the hardest thing to offer. But we are always moved by something that other people are doing, right? Like we are all influencers. So I'm opening up the floor to all of the artists in attendance to give acknowledgments to any of the pieces if if it's just comments um how we were touched moved but this is a time that us as artists that we have to spend acknowledging the work that we have done amongst ourselves so the floor is open to anybody i'd, I'd love to, to start um and start with a, a very special thank you to sarah and for uh, not just your vulnerability and courage and the peace that you made, but this challenge that you make uh, that, you know, any person of color, like, uh, has had to live with in a much different way than, of course, you live with the trauma that, like, uh, men have, like, um, uh, uh, like, impressed on you. But it's this idea of like, we're not allowed to be hurt or we're not allowed to be angry. We got to present a certain way so that people can be comfortable uh, with, uh, with the train wrecks this society has made of our lives. Um, and it's another form of erasure. You know, this, this idea that like, you know, we have to show up, um, put together you know, so that other people can feel uh, comforted or so that other people can feel uh, the light at the end of our tunnel. Um, and so I really appreciate uh, your insistence in showing up like where you're at and your statement that it is not your responsibility to like hold our um, discomfort uh, with what we as like society, what we as men, um, have contributed to or visited on you. So thank you for that. Uh, and and then Eddie, like, I, th I feel like, you know, you said a thing that like resonates with me so deeply, this idea of like, it's just people in prison. It's just people. And like, that's the, that's the take home. So like, thank you for that. And, and I'm, I'll let someone else talk now. <laughs> Sarah, <clears throat> I love you. You're beautiful. And uh, that 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 piece was it was powerful. It, it was really really powerful. Um, but you know, when we when we're in a place where all we have is that to express is art. And for you to come up with that creative idea, <laughs> it was beautiful. It was really, really beautiful. And, and um, that, uh, that moved me. That was one of the things that moved me. And um, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, man, that day we talked about uh, George, man, that day, man, I was so upset, <laughs> you know, because, um, I, man, we, we go through a lot, man, you know, as people, I always say it, I say it to my children, you know, the world is a beautiful place, man, people just mess it up, and, and I think that, you know, once we realize, man, that, that, you know, we all in this together, we, we all we got, you know, that was, a, that was something that we, we used to roll with when we was on the yard, you know, that's, we all we got, and you know, the response, yeah, we all we need, you know what I'm saying, but 
I think that that statement speaks volumes right now. Right now, I think that statement speaks volumes because it's the truth, man. It's the truth. We all we got. You know, um, I'm not trying to take away from from anybody's uh, belief in anything or anything like that. But, you know, right here, right now on this plane of existence, man, we all we got. So we got to treat each other better. We got to do better. And it's just, it's just like so hard for me sometimes because I know I don't deserve this. I know I don't deserve to be treated like this. Regardless of what you may think about me or what your parents might have told you I am, I'm not that. Uh, I think what we did today, man, I think it was powerful, man. And uh, I believe that it's just the, the scratch on the surface. You know, we have the ability to be the first pebbles in the avalanche. We can change it. You know, and uh, everything that we did here today, you know, exposing ourselves, being vulnerable, all of it, you know, pushes me to want to be better. And it's going to push other people to want to be better. Absolutely. Yeah. So, man, I, I thank everybody here, man. I thank all you guys. I thank the university, um, banks, you know, you well, I always, you know, you my partner, man. So it's like, man, I really, really appreciate it, man. Thanks, man, for involving me in this, y'all. No, thank you, um, Eddie. Again, people, especially in this day and age, where everything's about selfies and let me snap a quick pic, right? Um, when do we choose to make the things and the moments that we capture about the beauty of other people? All right, like it's, we're living in a climate where that shit don't exist. And it can be, it can be deterrent and it can start to condition us to think that we can, that we have to only think about ourselves. And the more we do that, the more somebody else feels left out. And the more we think about ourselves, the more we forget other people. So, I mean, man, I thank you for that kind of work. I thank you for doing that work without this being in mind, right? Without thinking about a platform or thinking about showcasing it to other people. I honor you and I exalt you for thinking about it and capturing people in a moment where you just wanted to highlight somebody else. I mean, that is beautiful. That is worthy of being acknowledged and exalted. And for me, to you, I thank you. <clears throat> thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, man, when I, when I see, well, like when you guys spoke about your pieces, all of you, like, I get frustrated, man. I'm so sick and tired of like, that. that's the emotion that comes up for me, man. Frustration. And it, and, and of course, like a deep sadness, right? Because it's been happening. It's been happening, man, and it still continues to happen. And like, I, 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 like, I like the messages, man. I like, I like what your pieces are talking about. I like what they're saying. And, and even though like, I, like, like, I'm glad I'm frustrated. Like, I'm like, like, I'm frustrated, man. Like, Oh, you don't even know, man. I can't even, I can't even watch like certain stuff like that documentary, like 13. I, I can't watch that. I can't watch that. I can't watch anything like that because it's, 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 it's just super frustrating for me, man. And I'm not going to blow up or nothing, but if anything, it just leaves me like really, really sad, man. How people, I don't know, man. But I appreciate your guys' work for sure. It's definitely, definitely like needed. And people got to see it. 
that it hurt. On YouTube server for sure. Um, but yeah, man. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. Even though, like, even though I'm like frustrated, like when I when it comes to like social inequality and, and racial injustice and mass incarceration, the shit that's been happening since the fucking beginning, man. And like, and we ain't even we ain't even got nowhere. We ain't got nowhere. Yeah, they let a bunch. Of, yeah, we're out. We're out, but like, it's not enough, man. It's not enough. Yeah. But yeah, thank you, thank you for your work, man, for sure. No, thank you. I was on the brink of crying until I realized you just been <laughs> snacking. <laughs> it's time to rise up. Man. Back. Let's go. <laughs> Hey, it was like this. Hey, I'm like, I'm like, don't cry. I'm like, oh, come on, man, hold it together. And I was like, yeah, man, shit, shit got to change, man. I'm like, is it good to snack? You got a snack? No, <laughs> oh, man, that's how I feel, man. I needed that. It's trauma oh, eating, man. It's trauma man. Uh, I needed that. You brought me back, boy. All right. What time? How much time we got? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and we get into that time. Oh my God, man. This is why I love the work that we do. This is why I am so grateful to be again in the amongst the the great people that you all are. Um if there's any if anybody wants to speak, let now be the time and then we're gonna get to some Q and A. So again, for everybody that's in attendance, if you haven't done it, drop a question, drop a comment. Right, let's try to get to it. We won't get to all of them here, but what we will do is we you guys will also get links and we will do our best. I'm going I'm to go through them and I'm going to answer as many as I possibly can. Um, I'm, I'm not going like, to speak for anybody else. So if there's comments for anybody else that are specific to different artists, I'm not going to answer that. It's not what I'm going to do. Anything directed to me or just in general, I got y'all. Y'all will be hearing from me. So please drop them comments, drop them uh, uh, questions. But yeah, artists, this is the last go round and then we're gonna get to some questions from the viewers. I wanna say one more thing. I wanna say one more thing. Like your okay. guys' artwork, man, it, it, it's, it, it creates movement in like, in me, like in me, like it creates this, like it creates something inside me when I look at it. So that's, that's what I appreciate about it, man. It, it, it gets it, it it brings people to action man and that's and that's the beauty of art and i think that's why i love art so much man it's 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 that powerful absolutely so thank um, you. real quick like i just want to say thank you this is awesome um it takes a lot of courage to be in this space <laughs> for some of us and uh you know it's like i feel like i'm grouping again you know like i remember the beauty of intimacy in a space where you know, everybody who's considered, no, right? Like we group it, like we in the game room, like we have a conversation with everyone, okay? And no funding behind it. Like we really <laughs> we wanna be here. So, you know, to me, that's the warmth and the love that connects us. And for us to show up in that space, it's, it, it's you know, when you get those goosebumps on your skin, when you know the truth is being told to the soul, that's what's up. So I just want to say thank you. I salute each and every one of you for holding this space, being who you are, and showing up. And everyone who's out there watching and listening, come on and group with us. Yeah, come, <laughs> come group. get in. Bring group. Get these, yeah, let's get in these comments and these questions. <laughs> I'm going to take my top off. All right. So let's get to some of these questions and answers. And I'm terrible at names. I'm an artist. So if I butcher it, it's not because I don't care. It's not because I don't love you guys. That's just not a part of one of the gifts I was given. I'm using everything I got to better the world. And sometimes, yeah, I might mess that up. Um, let's, okay, wait, those are open. Okay, let's go with, congratulations, congratulations. I'm, I'm looking for specifics for people. I should, I probably should not be doing this. I'm okay. So I'm, I'm like, I'm terrible at this part, but let's see. Thank you. This is just a comment. Thank you so much, Sarah. Your art is absolutely amazing and powerful. 
as an anonymous attendee. Congratulations, Prince Renaissance. Great to see you. Jane. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, I don't know, Jane. From Pup. That Jane? Is it that Jane? It's a bunch of Janes out there. I hope it is that Jane. If so, Jane. I know that Jane, too. Um, so this, I guess this is for anybody. Uh, what from your past gives you the most insight? <laughs> Who's going to take it? This gives me the most insight. Mm. <laughs> Can y'all see this, or am I am I the only one that's seen this? Am I no, scrolling? I see it in the chat, right? Yeah. Yeah, I see you. I have a short non-answer for that. <laughs> 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 um, I think that, like you know, it, it's there's never it's, there's, there's not going to be a one thing, like right? you know, we often often get this question about like what changed life for you or what it, what what turned you around, and there's there's not mm -hmm. a one moment it's a culmination of moments it's like life experiences like anything in your life and we're not we're not different from you in, it, in any in any way right you know it's like um so it's like a culmination of things uh some of the th really big things that have given me a lot of insight was um Meeting, meeting a young man who I had never met, but who knew me very well and who idolized a version of me that did not exist anymore. Uh, and that was like really a hard lesson in like, um, in the impact that we can have in this world. And it was not the kind of impact I wanted to have. Um, and it was like very devastating to know that he just represented one and many, one of many uh, kids who are probably, uh, making bad decisions because they wanted to be like me but it was also a lesson in if i have the power if i have that kind of power to uh impact this world and uh impact my community in, in a harmful way like i have just as much power to impact my community um in a positive way and like how that is uh sits in my life is in like you know my in my one twenty four seven uh fight against uh white supremacy that's what tells me that we can win that fight against white supremacy. Because mm -hmm. uh, um, if, if, if one person has that individual power collectively, there's really not a thing that we can't achieve. Absolutely. So I have a question. Eddie, snack man. He yeah. like, huh? He like, huh? Dinner, man. <laughs> <laughs> great. Do you, Eddie, this question is for you. It's from Catherine. Kathleen, Kath, see, I'm an artist. Kathleen, Christ. Um, Eddie, do you ever feel like you want to go back and visit Nika and others? Are you allowed to? Yeah, I've been back a few times. Um, I, it's, yeah, I, I, there's, those are my friends. Like, it's, yeah, I want to go back. I, can, I always want to go back. But it's kind of sad, you know? Mm. Cause I get to leave now and like they, they're stuck. Man, I, I got. I'm going. I'm going through other ones. I seen some for Sarah. It's. I, I'm trying to find it again. Forgive me. It's my first time doing this. Um. Yeah, I'm going through them too. Hey, man, it's some heavy ones too in here, man. So if y'all see something y'all want to answer to, just feel free. <laughs> I like this is this is. Oh, I like how you're mediating, man. Yeah, you know, I'm so used to like. Go ahead, it's okay. You can do it. I'm still learning. I'm still yeah. Learning it. No, it's okay. <laughs> um. Mm. So Saharla Betch, um, she said, "Thank you for naming trauma and all of this right now." And I think that that's really um, powerful because a lot of us. For me, my experience and others that I've talked to that have come home, it's like, we have to show up, we have to be present. We got all our chronos, we got all our embellishes, and this is who we are and we're gonna make it happen. Well, you know what, this is not a stage, okay? And I don't wanna put on that, that, that persona. So I know how to get naked and that's how I'm gonna present. And it's really, really, really difficult when I wanna lead with my trauma without sounding like I'm an emotional victim. Like I'm not, okay? But my body, my body keeps the score. We know that. So if I'm sitting in the, in the conference room at a table with you and you're telling me to do this on a, 
in this space and I can't comprehend, I don't, I don't mean I have the capacity because I'm learning a new set of, of ability to show up. That doesn't mean that I'm not present because I'm very present, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think like we honoring the fact that going through the prison system is extremely traumatic. It's condensed trauma. And a lot of us aren't even able to kind of hold that space and honor it without sounding like, woe is me, it's not the case. But I think that, um, you know, I've been coached, I've been trained and I've been polished to lead with my conviction. Well, today I'm gonna leave with my trauma because it's generational. And if we don't acknowledge that, then we gonna end up still at the table having conversations yes. about how to fix it. So oh, let's fix it, you know, so thank you, Saharla. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's we're winding down. So y'all keep the questions coming in. Again, we have a Google Doc that you guys can all like sit, put your questions in there, put your emails in there if you want to either continue the conversation or you really want your question to get answered. Like use it, man. This is a time to keep the conversation going outside of this little platform, outside of all the, all of these little boxes that are caging us. That's not even right, is it? That are like Trapping, yeah, that we're confined to these little boxes that we're confined to right now. Compartmentalizing us still, like yeah, you. right. Like we we exist beyond this. So please, man, get in the chat, get in that Google Doc, uh, send your like, let us hear your voices, let us hear your comments, concerns, anything. Um, yeah, man, let's keep the conversation rolling. We got about we got about ten minutes, so um, we're gonna keep rolling through this Q and A. Jay, if you see any questions, Eddie, Emil, anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and while you guys are searching, I have to send a big shout out to Nail and Glory who have been putting up with this entire process with yeah. me, right? Like my colleagues, I, I respect these women. I respect their, their intuition. I respect their experiences, right? Like I have no problem with saying if that's what you believe is gonna work, like, let's do it. I have no problem with following their lead because they have been um, outstanding and upstanding people in, throughout this project. So thank you. I mean, please, please know that I'm very, very grateful and thankful to have been working with you guys throughout this. So whoop, whoop, hooray to those, mm -hmm. those young ladies. Um, Here's a good question right here. It says for all the artists, what other artists, writers, musicians inspire your work? Have those changed over time or with the uh, perspective since coming home? Mm -hmm. My favorite artist has always been Ernie Barnes. That's who inspired me. Wow. No. Instagram got a bunch of bomb artists. I'm quick to see something on Instagram and I'll be like, I'm done. I'm out. That's how good art has gotten. And I'm like, like oh my God. And then, I mean, we've really been this good this entire time. <laughs> so I want to send a shout out to Instagram. Thank y'all for, you know what I'm saying, for <laughs> all these artists. Because, man, I see something to be like, yeah, I'm going to take that. I'm going to try that. I'm going to use that. So all of the artists that may not have a stage um, or like a, a major platform, I would just like those are the people that in, in, inspire me and keep me to that and that keep me on this journey of like just growing and getting better. So I'm inspired by everybody. I'm inspired by today. I don't ain't no telling what's gonna happen after this event. I don't know, but it might be some art. Boop. So we can go on and check in with that. It's a great I question. Was inspired, I was inspired by two photographers who came to visit us. Uh, um, um, in San Quentin. Uh, one of them's name, or her name was Rona Bittner, and a gentleman by the name of uh, David Johnson. So I was really, it was really good to meet those folks, and they definitely inspired me for sure. Um, I've been inspired by all the ladies um, in prison, like <laughs> the conversations, the dark moments. Uh, seeing their trauma, seeing the laughter, um, building, sharing in that space. Like um, even the challenges from correctional officers when they have to show up and have to, to hold that space. Like, um, and I've been inspired by 
everyone who's had an influence in my life, you know, uh, deeply, deeply inspired the way they made me feel, you know, you, we always remember how people make us feel. So that's kind of been my, my inspiration in that space. My, the, the lifelong experiences of, of what I felt through everyone that I've connected yeah. with, good and bad. <laughs> good and bad. I also want to say, man, Emil's a really good writer. I read some of his stories, and there's this one line that just, I'll never forget it. Like, he was telling a story about his dad was looking for him and he gave out this like his voice tore the sky open or or something like that mm. but but man uh email definitely inspires me for sure yeah you miss a powerhouse oh yeah i give you that one <laughs> no art you know art you know what i'm saying i remember actually when this was i believe 2000 and 15, me and Emil took a creative writing class for Pup. And that's when I was like, okay, he's competition. I gotta, I gotta make sure. <laughs> that's <laughs> I gotta make sure I bring my A game. <laughs> good. Like this one's good. So yeah. I, yeah. I'm I'm inspired by all of the artists here as well as, you know, Instagram, my Instagram people that I follow. Yeah, like, super dope too. Yeah, um, it's a bunch of questions. And again, if we do not get to you guys' questions here and now, you will be hearing from me. And I believe that it is in um, if it's in the artist's capacity to do so. Like, you will be hearing from them as well. I'm not speaking for them. I'm just optimistic about, <laughs> about hey, every Anthony, connection to this work. Yeah. Here's a question to you from Jay. Antoine, you say you have only been up for a little while. How have people responded to your artwork? And what are you hoping to achieve through your art? Um, I've gotten a lot of great responses from my artwork. Um, I've gotten a lot of people like invested in like seeing my artwork in other places, which is like really, really humbling. Um, and what I what I hope to like, really showcase and what I really hope people get from my art is the fact that, again, like, man, art is about a process. If the, if the end result is something that we are happy with, like, that is the beauty. And sometimes, again, for me, I might not paint every single portion of the canvas because I don't believe that, um, I, I believe that the story is never finished. Mm -hmm. And that the image is never done. And when people see it, they always add their own interpretation. So it's always evolving. It's always being added to. So I just hope that people see something and realize if it's not finished or what they, if they think it's not finished, that doesn't mean that it's not what it's supposed to be. So it's just kind of being okay with the fact that I may not be where or what I want to be, but I am happy and I am beautiful where I am and how I am. So that's what I hope people take from my art and apply to their art and their life in general. I got a question right here uh, from Elisa. As artists, can you describe your vision of a world without prisons? What does it look like? What will it take to get there? I think a world without prisons would it would look, I'm trying to see how I can say this. If you, could, if you could ever imagine balance and accountability across the scale, that's what that world would look like. Because being criminalized is, has been a, a tool that has been used to continue to add each brick onto the prisons that have been growing like year in and year out for decades, right? And when we think about a world without prison, we think about people stepping up in a way that changes the proximity. You can't just do this with me or with anybody else and be like, I'm out of the, the frame. No. So a world without prisons 
require more people to be active and involved in their communities. It requires more people to be active and involved with things that they might not believe affects them. And it is my belief that we, by coming from system impacted communities, because I come from South Central, like ground zero for a lot of, a lot of, um, of the mistreatment, that doesn't mean that that ripple, that ripple effect doesn't affect these communities in Marin. It doesn't affect these uh, suburban areas in Oakland and in San Francisco and all over the United States, all over the world. Um, my impact will have an impact on your life. So it requires us to look at proximity different because you don't look like me or because you don't come from my hood or your household don't look like mine. That doesn't mean that you are not responsible for how I'm being treated. And that doesn't mean that I'm not responsible for how you should be treated or viewed. So a world without prisons, it makes everybody accountable. And I think that's something that, I think that is a reality that a lot of people would be afraid to, um, to live if we all had to be accountable to one another. It might, I think it'd be better, but I just think people would be afraid of it. Mm. My thoughts. Yeah. I think that I think I, 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 uh, Alexandria Castillo Cortez said something that really resonates with me when you think about this idea of like what does a world without prisons look like? Look like, um, and we already know what that looks like. Like you said, it looks like suburbia. Mm -hmm. You know, and look, that's that we already have a world without prison. Mm. Um, the thing is like can we treat everybody like there are children like what ha what what do what happens when like our children commit harm as we do everything that we can to not only repair the harm but to give our children what they need to to to, to succeed um and so that's what a world without prison looks like it looks like suburbia mm -hmm. uh, i would also say that you know a world without prison also looks like universal health care, right? It looks like no homelessness, yep. right? We often think about a world without prison as this, as, as this project of like taking something out of the world, but what it actually is is a project, a project of putting something in the world. Like that's the average person like, hey, do you believe in housing for everybody? Do you believe in universal health care? Do you believe in like a universal income for everybody? Do you believe in an end of, an end of poverty, to, an end to poverty? Most people will say yes. And so given that it's like, would you trade police departments for that? Mm. Like if that was the cost of universal health care and that was the cost of like an end of homelessness, would you trade police departments for that? Because that's an exact, that's an essence what we're doing. Like the money we like, I think Los Angeles has like, um, like, I mean, you just take prisons, right? Like we're not even like police, we spend way more on, we spend like a shit ton of money on police departments, but we spend about $80, $80 billion on prisons uh, every year. And the price tag to end homelessness is like $20 million or $20 billion. Like we could end homelessness tomorrow if we wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, if we would stop, if, if we would bridge the gap and get rid of prisons and get rid of police. And people often have these feelings like, but we need prisons, we need police to be safe. Mm -hmm. And that's like a misnomer, that's a misrepresentation. Like I understand a person's fear at like not having any police in a world where so-called crime exists, but we don't need the police. We are dependent on the police. And that's a very different thing, right? Like if, 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 if you look at, if you think about what it looks like for like, let's say um, a spouse to be in an abusive relationship and be in a dependent relationship, we wouldn't say to that spouse who doesn't have other options, who can't, who can't take care of themselves economically, who doesn't have a place to go, who is physically in danger if they leave that house. We don't say that, our plan isn't to say, oh, well, you need all that. So, you know, we're just gonna like keep doing it. No, the, the strategy is how, like, we get that this person doesn't have the means to leave this abusive household. But our approach to that is how do we build a bridge to the world where they can leave that household safely?
And that's the difference between dependence and need. So we're dependent on our current criminal justice system. That is not a good thing. That is the problem. And so the question, because what do we do and how do we build the bridge from this place of dependence, right, to a place of liberation? Um, and like all of those things are what a world without prison looks like. It's a world of liberation. It's a place, it's a place where we're not dependent on the very systems that oppress us to feel safe. Uh, it's a place where, um, where, we where, where we treat everybody's children like we want our children to be treated. So we are at that time, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all of you who stuck in this entire time, man, who um, shared your comments, who shared your questions. Again, I'm going to do my best, as I believe all the artists will, but we are coming to that hard stop in just a few minutes. So last question, our comments, concerns? Anything, anything that any of the artists want to share before we bring this event to a close? Grateful. I guess not. So with that, <laughs> with that, Jason, Sarah, Eddie, Emil, Nail, Glory, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And for those that are still here, check out their social medias, follow their pages, uh, keep up with their art, continue the conversation, extend your thank yous, extend all of that. Like, man, not only do we um, appreciate it, it's healing for us to be seen. It is needed in not just our communities, but in the community that you all come from. So in a matter of liberation, we're one step closer, man. With that, I'm going to say thank you. Peace. Peace, y'all. Blessings. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Love you guys. I love y'all. Thank you. <sighs>